Hi, welcome, thank you. Good evening, I'm Catherine Morris. I'm the Sackler Family Curator of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And um, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight for what promises to be an amazing conversation. We have with us um, Maren Hassinger, Lorraine O'Grady, Andrea Brownlee Barnwell, Linda Good Bryant, and Dinga McKinnon to have a conversation that will grow upon um, an afternoon that we all spend together here um, talking about ideas and imagining what an exhibition might look like here in the Sackler Center and in the Brooklyn Museum in 2017 around the um, 10th anniversary of the Sackler Center here. Um, an exhibition that imagines multiple feminisms, feminisms that have not been addressed in an exhibition form and how we might do that. So it's a very exciting opportunity for us. And when we were lucky enough to get everybody here today, I should mention that Howardina Bindel was supposed to join us this evening, but unfortunately was not able to, though she reassures us she's here in spirit. Um, we wanted to then, it became obvious that we also needed to have a public conversation. So that's why we are here tonight and are very glad that you're all here with us and we look forward to you um, contributing to the conversation. I'm gonna read a brief um, biography for Andrea Brownlee Barnwell and she will do a more formal introduction of the people up on the stage who don't need an introduction. Um, so Andrea is an art historian, curator, writer, and the director of Spelman College Museum of Fine Arts. Um, her exhibitions include Ian Rosewell, Rosiel Brown, A Cubed, Black on Both Sides in 2004, Amalia Amaki, Boxes, Buttons, and the Blues in 2006, Hale Woodruff, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, and the Academy in 2007, Cinema Remixed and Reloaded, Black Women Artists and the Moving Image since 1970, from 2007. Maria Magdalena Compost Pons, Dreaming of an Island in 2008. Undercover, Performing and Transforming Black Female Identities, 2009. And Ingrid Mwangi, Robert Hutter, Constant Triumph, 2011. These are among the projects that she has curated and co-curated in her 14 years at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Arts. In 2011, she spearheaded 15 by 15, an initiative to acquire 15 works of art in celebration of the museum's 15th anniversary. I just wanna mention briefly before I turn over the mic that the process of thinking about this exhibition and, and bringing everybody together here today was a collaborative process amongst myself and several colleagues who I would love to mention as this is a um, true collaboration. Um, Rue Hockley, uh, Radia Harper, Eugenie Sai, Jess Wilcox, Saisha Grayson, and Stephanie Weisberg have all been part of this conversation too. Thank you very much. Good evening. Can you all hear me okay? Let's try this again. Good evening. That's how we do it in the South. I just have, just, just have to say that. I'd like to also thank Rujeko Hako, Rujek, see, there you go. Rujeko Hockley for the invitation as well as Jess. I feel like there's a lot of um, reverberation. Am I too loud? It's okay? All right, great. Connie Choi. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for being here tonight. There are so many other places that you could have been I know a lot of people are popping popcorn and getting ready to pour a glass of red wine in preparation for scandal. <laughs> I know that um, there is a um, Norman Lewis opening in Philadelphia. Lots of stuff happening around town. Jason Moran's performing. Lots of places that you could have been. But the fact that you all decided to be here tonight is exceptional. You're in for a dynamic treat, and it's quite a privilege that you all have extended the invitation for me to help share in this conversation. We have a lot of people that might perhaps be joining us via live stream, so be on your best behavior. You never know who might be watching. As Caroline mentioned, I've had the great pleasure of being the director of the Spelman College Museum of Fine Arts since 2001. As some of you all might know, Spelman College emphasizes art, 
by women of the African diaspora. This conversation fits squarely in my wheelhouse, and I'm really delighted to be here tonight. We spent the day revisiting exhibitions and conversations and topics, and I get to talking fast because this stuff is so intoxicating and exciting to me. In recent months, the museum has presented two original solo exhibitions. In the spring, we presented Marin Hassinger, Dreaming, and the exhibition that's currently on view is Howardina Pendel, and again, she sends her regrets tonight, but under the weather. So in a very strange way, I feel like I've been preparing for this very conversation for a very long time. So tonight, we're gonna have a conversation. First, I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists. I'm gonna introduce them in the order that they're going to go. Dinga McCannon is a fiber artist, painter, printmaker, teacher, author, illustrator, she began her career at age 16 in 1965 when she joined the YUC Artist Collective in, Art in Harlem. In 1971, she and Faith Ringgold and the late Kay Brown founded Where We At? Black Women Artists, the first African-American women artists group. The group lasted for 25 years. Ms. Cannon has exhibited her works worldwide including the Renwick Gallery at the Smithsonian, the Schomburg, the American Craft Museum, the Folk Art Museum, the National Museum for Women in the Arts, um, so many different um, venues throughout the country. Her work is included in the collections of the Brooklyn Museum, Johnson Publications, Procter & Gamble, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and also the Schomburg. Next up, we'll have Marin Hassinger, Marin Hassinger was born in Los Angeles, and after studying dance and sculpture at Bennington College, she completed her MFA in fiber arts at UCLA. You all still with me? Okay, sometimes I take people's temperature. So she began, while in Los Angeles, she began making sculptures with bent, twisted, and frayed wire rope, and created and participated in numerous performances throughout Los Angeles. Now based in New York City, Hassinger continues to create sculpture, installation, videos, performance, and public artworks that deal with equity in our changing relationship to nature. Hassinger has exhibited widely and broadly in the United States and abroad. She is the recipient of many awards and honors, including grants from the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation, the Paula Krasner Foundation, the Ghali Foundation, Anonymous Was a Woman, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Women's Caucus for the Arts. Since 1997, long time, 1997, she has been the director of the Reinhardt School of Graduate Sculpture at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. So our third panelist is Linda Good Bryant. Linda Good Bryant is an award-winning filmmaker who has had a varied career in the arts. In 1974, she began Just Above Midtown Gallery, the first exhibition space to primarily present the work of African American and other artists of color in a major gallery district. In the mid-1970s, she began making experimental and documentary films Filmmaking caused her to start the Active Citizen Project in order to pursue her ongoing interest in creating art with social and economical elements and the capacity to change social and economic conditions in places where it occurs. Ms. Good Bryant has a Bachelor of Arts degree in art from <clears throat> Spelman College <clears throat> and a Master's degree in business from Columbia University. She has received numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and an Emmy Award nomination, and also a Peabody Award for film. Do you see what I'm saying, what I'm up here with? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? <clears throat> Last, but certainly not least, is Lorraine O'Grady. Lorraine O'Grady combines strategies related to humanist studies on gender, the politics 
of diaspora as well as identity and reflections on aesthetics by using a variety of mediums that include performance, photo installation, moving media, and photo montage. Turning to visual arts in the late 1970s, O'Grady became an active voice within the alternative New York art world of the time. In addition to addressing feminist concerns, her work tackled cultural perspectives that had been underrepresented during the feminist movements of the early 1970s. O'Grady lives and works in here in New York. So Dinga, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah. All right, good evening. My name is Dinga McCann, in case you don't know me. Um, I'm going to reverse things. I have, I think, a, a bunch of slides dealing with where we at black women artists, but I wanted to give you kind of an overview of our uh, organization, so if you're not familiar with us, you'll know who we were. <laughs> where we at um, was a collective of black women artists that was started in 1971. Although I'm from Harlem, um, the group started by coming to my studio on the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. Most of our members were from right around the corner. Uh, I think for a long time, one of our offices was at uh, Crown Street, with Priscilla Taylor. Okay. The 60s were a time when African Americans rose up and started screaming for justice, equality, and our long overdue piece of the American pie. The arts flourished as we as black artists created works about us and the likeness of us, and many of us being openly and proudly inspired by African culture, clothing, and art. In, 1970, in 1964, at 17, I joined with the Art Collect Collective, the beginning of my art career. When I joined the group, it consisted of men and a few women. Over the next few years, the women kind of disappeared, and it was just me. For a while, it was fine, but by 1971, I began to wonder where all the other women artists were. I called Kay Brown, who used to live in Brooklyn, who called Faith Ringo, and together, we started calling around to see um, if we could find all the women artists. So, after we call, we would call people and say, do you know any black American artists, women? And they would say, no, we don't know any. And we'd say, but who are you talking to? I'm one of them. But anyhow, to make a long story short, we finally got 14 artists together. After a meeting or two, uh, we really enjoyed being together. We decided to find a place to uh, exhibit. No gallery would have us. We finally found um, Nigel Jackson, who had a gallery on Charles Street in the village, and he gave us our first show. The feeling at the time was that women were not serious. We would run off, get married, and be mothers, and not have long art careers, so nobody really wanted to invest in us. The camaraderie between the women from the first exhibition inspired us to stay together as a group. We called ourselves where we at because when we asked where are the women artists, people said there aren't any. So where we at was here we are. Although we started with 14 women, over the years at various times there were more than 40 or 50 members. The original 14 were Kay Brown, Faith Ringo, Carol Blank, Pat Davis, Charlotte Richardson, Ani Millar, Geraldine Crooks, May May LeBeau, Ann Tangsley, Jean Taylor, Madhu Tanzania, Marian Francis, Carol Bayard, and myself. Uh, where we have black women artists consisted not only of artists, but of craftspeople, textile artists, graphic designers, photographers, sculptors, museums, I mean, musicians, writers, teachers, and administrators. Although our main purpose was to collectively support one another and find opportunities where we could exhibit, sell our works, and find other ways of generating income, our mission statement included 
that number one, we existed as a sisterhood. Number two, we wanted to preserve our artistic and cultural legacy while seeking to unite humankind through the visual, performing, and creative arts. We were dedicated to the dissemination of information on the historical and contemporary achievements of African American people. We became incorporated in 1972, and in 1979, we received our 501c3 nonprofit status. We founded committees who uh, researched grants and which enabled us to create jobs for us as artists and teachers. We created arts outreach programs, survival art programs for families in shelters. We went to Bedford Hills prison facility and assisted in the South 40 program, which turned pottery and other crafts into income producing venues for women prisoners with families. We also created a six-story mural at 24 Furman Avenue. Basically, uh, we existed in Brooklyn. We used a lot of the facilities that you have right here in the community. Okay, now I think we're gonna show this. Um, this first one has uh, half of a head. Let me see if you can see the whole piece. This is from where we at. This was one of our posters. Uh, as you see, it wasn't like any other poster you ever saw, but it definitely got the point of her. This is one of our uh, flyers, because that was the day of Xeroxing, where we did a retreat, because one of the things we also did was take women, men, children, and families uh, away so that they could do art. Okay. This is another, uh, this is an invitation to an exhibition. Our graphic committee consisted of whoever was available at the time. I think I may have designed this one. This is one of our favorite posters called Cooking and Smoking. Um, one of the things that where we at became known for is that we kind of discarded the wine and cheese and we would feed people because as artists we were hungry and we figured everybody else was. <laughs> okay. um, this is Close Connections. This is one of our shows where we showed with uh, the way you see Artist Collective, which is in Harlem. This is me in a magazine for Black Creations. I was interviewed, I'm a lot younger. That's I, <laughs> and a waste time. <laughs> 1973. Yeah, 1973. <laughs> okay. I know that, but the waistline it has issues. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Pat Davis, I believe, who was a photographer, she wrote the article and also took the photograph. This is a big part of the group. And another thing I forgot to tell you is that where we at came to the Brooklyn Museum around 72, we were here advocating to have a women's art show. And although it took uh, maybe like 60 years, here we are, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, sometimes it never happens, so we did good. <laughs> All right, this is Carol Blank. Um, this is the late Carol Blank, unfortunately. This is one of her beautiful artworks. And like I said, we took pride in um, using Africa as a viable source of inspiration for our, many of our works. Okay. This is, on the end here is Marion Francis, who was a copper, or is, even though she's bad, copper repose master. And she lives in Brooklyn. This is Joining Forces, another exhibition that we gave with um, the UC Artist Collective. This is Empress Okweke, who used to live right down the block. She was our business manager. And she, her claim to fame was that she looked a lot like Patti LaBelle. <laughs> This is one of my works, it's called Woman Alone, and I think uh, on this screen, it's 
it's going this way. The woman is supposed to be here, and all of this stuff up here is the stuff that's going on in her mind. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> I think that a lot of my work has shown contrary behavior, which is evidence of my inclination to protest. But it hasn't always been overt. And so I want you to think about that as you look at these slides. Um, I also am working on an equity project that I suppose will be going on until I stop making work. And part of that is a, a real problem with sitting on a stage higher than you, using a microphone to talk to you, because I want to be part of you. And um, I feel like the whole issue of equality has to do with my position to you as an artist. So. Imagine I'm sitting next to you somehow. <laughs> okay. The next time you see me talking, I'll be sitting next to you. So practice. Okay. All right. These first uh, couple of things I'm showing you are from uh, 1972. I was a graduate student at UCLA. And um, it was fiber structure, and I had a wonderful mentor. Um, his name is Bernard Kester, who allowed me to be his first MFA student. So I was thinking about fiber structure and linear flexible units, um, which ropes and chains are. And um, this all happened post uh, Watts riots, post the death of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and this is what I made, and I called it the river. And this one, I didn't really have a title for, but it looks like nooses. And the thing that's very strange about this is somehow, even though I, was th I, I wasn't thinking about politics or activism, it came through in the work as I matriculated as the one and only African-American student in my fiber structure class. And so this is what I made. And looking back on it, it looks incredibly political. It looks um, like nooses. And the other one looked like chains and rope. It was made from chains and rope. And all of the things that are implied by chains and rope and by rope with nooses on the ends. But the thing is, I never thought about that. I didn't think about that consciously at all. And all I was really thinking about was how to manipulate plier linear materials. And I, looking back on that, I don't know. I, I have to give a lot of credit to the unconscious. I had gotten a degree from Bennington College in sculpture. And Bennington, if you don't know about it, is one of the most prestigious schools where you can learn about art. I was making huge outdoor sculptures. And then when I tried to get into uh, the sculpture program at UCLA, um, I was not accepted there. But I was accepted in the design department without even asking. And my professor, Bernard Kessler, as I mentioned, stepped up for me, and then he allowed me to be his first MFA student. So he was really my hero for those years and afterwards. And I think when I think back on those times that, for example, at Bennington, I was even discouraged from being the dance major I wanted to be, and I became the sculpture major. And then when I tried to um, when I tried to continue my sculpture studies and um, was denied that opportunity and was kind of 
forced into the design department um, without any question. I, I never had a chance to question that decision they made. I can't help but thinking, looking back on that, that there was something afoot that I had absolutely no control over, and I think a lot of it had to do with racism and sexism. Um, this is a shot of 1973. Um, it was my thesis exhibition. I was thinking about minimal art. I was thinking about a material that could last that wasn't yarn. I was thinking about weaving materials that weren't yarn. I was thinking about Eva Hess. I was thinking about movement. And what I made was anti-monumental. From 76, in a two-person show I had at Arco Center for Visual Art, um, these are my early thoughts about nature and language the swells of the ocean, as well as feminine anatomy. I also thought about nature as a site for solace. Equal seas, equality. Um, this one is called Pas de Dieu, and again, my dance um, training, which I'd continued to take classes even though I wasn't performing at this point. I combined wire rope and its organic par par partner in found wood. It's a dead peach tree from my friend Louis's house. And um, it was installed at the Claremont Colleges. I think here I was thinking about oneness, equilibrium, healing, restoration. Um, and here's one that a lot of people probably know about from the um, the various shows that Sangha has put these photos in. Um, in 1978, Sangha called me on the phone out of the blue. I didn't know her. She somehow knew me, or at least knew to call me. And um, she just started talking about being an artist in Los Angeles, being black, being a woman. And from that time till this, which is over 40 years, we've been together as close friends and associates and partners in this project that she calls RSVP, which is made out of uh, pantyhose. Um, and so one day in 1978, with the help of Herman, Herman Outlaw, who was a photographer, we just fooled around in these pantyhose. <laughs> And um, Harmon took the pictures, and he later, you know, printed them out. And then last year, we went to London, and um, it was pretty fabulous. After 40 years of something that happened one afternoon that was playful, and um, so I, what I found out when I was working with Sangha all these years is. When you're activating somebody's work, they're providing a framework for you to, to activate it. And you are activating it according to your predilection for being in that framework. So it is a true collaboration, not only of minds, but in this case, of bodies. So I continued with the dance ideas and with the ideas about daily life. This is Diaries from 1978. It was part of a trilogy that included other parts called Lives and Vanities. This particular one was performed in an artist's space in 78, and it's a diary of those people's lives. Again, it was a collaboration. They provided a movement phrase, and I helped direct the sequence of phrases. And this is the Vanities part of that trilogy. I used all my uh, physical attributes that at that time I was vain about. And the third piece, which I'm not showing, uh, is called Lives and used mothers and their children. And I've kind of continued that idea now with my daughter Ava and our collaboration, which she has called Matriarch. Um, the, this is called Grid uh, and Perimeter. And Grid is the tiny inset there. And uh, these are made out of pebbles and plaster and paint and um, all of these nature-related pieces have a political underpinning, and, and that's what we are now calling conservation. At the time, I don't think we really called it anything. Um, 
the whole thing about nature for me is about its loss and how since the Industrial Revolution the concept of nature has completely changed. I'm not referring to nature because it's pretty or can provide solace, which it can, but because it's vanishing and I'm remembering it. This is when I combine the search for nature with a desire to define the space as well. The space of this room is defined by this natural path of homemade stones. This is Beach from 1980, and Linda should recognize that because it's in her space. This was in the fall, just above Midtown downtown on Franklin Street. The summer before, I'd done a similar installation for Art on the Beach with Creative Time. That one, I planted wire rope in the sand, and it looked as if it was blowing with the wind. The direction of the rope suggested wind. When I moved the idea inside to Linda's, it was made from these manufactured stones and dowels, and I think these pieces are actually about the same thing, which is the poignance of nature vanishing. Also in 1980, a situation that I think Linda got me involved in, um, it was this Grand Central installation sponsored by Remy Mar Martin, the alcohol people. And um, I was about to change chandeliers in the waiting room space at Grand Central, and I, my attempt was to unify the space. And then on the day that we were supposed to be lighting these chandeliers, with red bulbs instead of white ones, um, they wouldn't let me do it. So then I came up with the idea of red tape, uh, which actually illustrated what had happened. And uh, so I decided to use the red tape. And in, I decided to use it in the shape of either a crucifix or a cruciform. And I put the tape on walls and different objects, including the pew-like seating in Grand Central. And I put crosses on people, and then it instantly related to fabric, just like my fabric studies. It related immediately to textiles. And then I put the cross on myself, and it was like crosses on Ash Wednesday. So this was a multi-partite demonstration of an ability to improvise. And I also had a red suit on, because red was the theme. And once I put crosses on everybody, and they moved throughout the space, it was, it was, like a sculpture in motion. It was a dance. It was a choreographed thing. Um, then I had the um, opportunity back in LA to do a uh, one-person show at um, the LA County Museum of Art. And this one is called On Dangerous Ground. It's wire rope, 21 units on the walls and on the floors, about four feet high for the bush-looking things. And the stuff on the wall about three to four feet wide. I was struggling with the idea of being in a museum and the museum is a marketplace, but these objects in the museum that were protective of me, they were sharp and spiky and angry and protective of my position as an artist. Theoretically, a museum is a place where we preserve the past and I was a living artist, so what was I doing in a museum? It was really important to me at this point to question the viability of that museum. I guess it's very political and maybe in the worst way, biting the hand that feeds me. And um, this is Sanganai and some other folks from LA um, participating in a, in a performance we call Flying from 1982. And this piece was part of a show that began at PS1 here called Afro-American Abstraction. It was curated by April Kingsley. That was 1982, that was a long time ago. Um, anyhow, it was a collaboration between Sanga, Ulysses Jenkins, Frank Parker, and Tony Goodwin. We performed at this opening at Barnstall Municipal Art Gallery. We moved along the architecture. There was music and video provided by Ulysses and Frank, and Tony made trips to UCLA to get the bird films which we danced in front of. Sang and I moved along and even flew. Um, this is Pink Trash 
from 82. It's in three New York City parks, Prospect, Van Cortlandt, and Central. I felt strongly about the inappropriateness of litter in the environment, so I chose pink as the color for painting litter that I tossed around. So it was very formal in the complementary color area because pink and greens were complements. Somebody um, saw the in installation, which you see here, and said, oh, this looks like fall leaves, which is very poetic because I think sometimes the garbage in our streets and gutters are like fall leaves. As the attributes of our industrial society, garbage may be leaves. In heaven in 1985, it was a show I did at Cal State University in Northridge outside of LA. Uh, preserved root or leaves are pasted on the walls. And I got these leaves from working in the florist shop as a salesperson, which I did for many years before I got a real teaching job. And the leaves were scented and glued to the wall like wallpaper. I was working in the flower shop and teaching drawing in the evenings at UCLA Extension. The inset of that is a piece, the title piece of the show from Spellman this year, um, which is called Dream, The Dream. But you can see that even though they're years and years apart, that this idea of using leaves began you know, over 20 years ago. So, um, finally, um, I, I'd like to say that um, the most, I guess, obviously feminist work that I've made is something called women's work. And it's a performance that's not really about the time frame that this show will be in, but it does try to include the entire audience and those things have become very, very special to me because I don't see how um, we can go on in the way we're going without mutual support. Um, thank you. So one of the um, unexpected benefits of uh, this past after afternoon and tonight is uh, having a chance to remember. And I really appreciate, Marin, you bringing up Remy Martin. It did two things. It made me <laughs> shudder because it was a disaster, that collaboration. And at the same time, it made me feel really great to remember how in the worst possible situation you were able to come up with a piece that was so effective in Grand Central Station. So thank you again for that. Um, whenever I'm um, put in a position to think about feminist, feminism or feminist art, uh, I immediately, uh, my mind goes in two directions. And one direction is identity and the other direction is aesthetic. is not me. There we go. <laughs> and and what I what I what I remember, or at least make myself think I remember, is that all of us at some point in time are just pure spirit. We are pure energy. We are absent of all the things that are imposed upon us. And it's in that moment that I think we are fully open to being uh, actualized as human beings. Um, that's how we start out. But then we get things imposed on us, like tiaras. <laughs> uh, and you start to think, OK, I got to wear this tiara. And then it goes from tiaras to prom dresses, which are never <laughs> comfortable. And then it goes from prime dresses to wedding gowns, if you decide to go that way when you hook up with somebody. And then it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And all these impositions start to shape us um, into, compliant, um, into compliant beings where we are, our minds start to think only the standards that we're given. 
our bodies start to act in ways that conform with protocols. Uh, and more and more, that pure spirit, that pure energy, that full possibility starts to shrink and shrink. And then you become somebody else's my. And I'm gonna tell you, getting little trinkets from guys when I was in high school that said, love you, and Linda on the, on the front, and in this case, love George on the back, made me feel so valued. And at the same time, I had no idea who the fuck I was. But I was loved by George and several others who gave me <laughs> little, gold <laughs> little gold bracelets that claimed me. I was their mine. <laughs> at some point though, and I think all of us go through this, guys and gals, quite frankly, at some point, there, if we're lucky enough, we become really determined to touch back, reach down into, and, and, and reconnect with that pure possibility we weren't, once were. And it's a blurry, messy thing. And you're saying, what the devil is this? Just above Midtown was my first my. Not me as somebody else's my, but me as my am. And through just about Midtown, things got clearer and clearer and clearer about what my possibility, my potentiality wanted to express. As an artist, as a being on this earth, I am very, very interested in the possibility of creating work that has the capacity to change the social and economic conditions where it occurs. The work I'm currently doing now is called Project Ease. And any of you who pass the tents that are now being dismantled right now outside uh, pass part of this project. And that's a farm stand. The possibility that a farm stand can be art that changes the conditions we live in is something I'm very interested in. Thank you. Uh, I used to be married to a runner and uh, he did relays occasionally and he explained to me the principle of the relay and it's always that the first person is a strong runner and gets out in front and then the second person holds the lead and then the third person really increases the lead and then all the fourth person has to do is just bring it home. hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so let's I hope I can do that. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I'm sort of at a disadvantage because I did not prepare uh, this uh, PowerPoint. I don't even know what images we're going to see. Um, but in the context, let's see what, what can, okay, there's my name, right? Oh, oh, okay. Well, in the context of, uh, of uh, the show, which is about a rethinking of uh, feminist art from the point of view of its beginnings and why certain, certain uh, works and workers were privileged and others were made invisible, uh, I think that um, I'm trying to fit my own, my own work in that, and I was explaining this afternoon that my work itself is not necessarily what I would call feminist work. I make work as a woman, but not necessarily always as a political feminist. Uh, if anyone asks me, well, what did you do for feminism? I'd have to point not to a body of work, but to my writing. And I would say that my most important contribution to feminism has been Olympia's Maid, an article that I wrote. Uh, also, you know, all of this work that I've done as an activist. Uh, so I don't really know how to speak about my work uh, in other than, say, the terms that sort of Marin is you. Just what you did at the moment, what, what presented itself for you, to you as something to think about, um, as, uh, as, uh, as something that was compelling you to express itself through you. 
and um, I noticed that the, I did not prepare this uh, PowerPoint, and it's interesting to me that whoever did it at the gallery put up a piece, uh, which is um, the red di diptych from uh, a piece that I call uh, The First and the Last of the Modernists. Uh, and it was uh, done uh, in 2009, just a few months after Michael uh, Jackson died. And uh, it was done in response to an invitation from a French feminist magazine called Petunia. And uh, the editors were French feminist artists, and I don't know how they had heard about me, but they said they wanted me to do a centerfold. And that their invitation came about two weeks after Michael had died. And by that point, I was trying to explain to myself why on earth have I been crying like a baby when I didn't even listen to him that much? Because I was a Prince fan. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be so, uh, I, so then I had to, uh, so in order to answer this question of like these unexpected, overwhelming tears that I experienced at his death, I plunged into um, fan culture. It was at that moment in 2009, there was a burgeoning of what was already a big fan culture, but into something even extraordinarily beyond that. And I was on every single uh, Michael Jackson uh, chat room website, whatever you want to call it. I, um, I've learned more about Michael uh, than I thought I would ever know. And one of the things that I learned was that he had not stopped growing. Everybody, the, the uh, I actually had been a rock critic at one point, and I know David Marsh, and I know, and he was perhaps one of the writers most responsible for this, which is that this idea that after Thriller, Michael did nothing. And that is simply was not the truth. It was like so astonishing to me uh, that uh, he had uh, continued uh, to grow. Unlike many child prodigies, I think I would say that Michael was one of the few child prodigies who fulfilled his genius throughout his lifetime. And, um, and that was so astonishing to me that I began to think about his attitude toward his, uh, his artwork, toward himself as an artist, toward the, and his ideas about the meaning of art. And uh, the only thing that I could really compare him to, in my mind, was uh, an, uh, another artist, uh, a poet, that I had been teaching for 25 years, and that was Charles Baudelaire. So, I made this, uh, Charles Baudelaire, as you know, is, was the father of modernism, basically. He was the first modernist poet and the first modernist art critic. And, uh, and I knew an awful lot more about uh, Baudelaire than I knew about, uh, about Michael at that time. Uh, but everything that I learned about Michael was sort of like becoming a parallel to me for what I knew about Baudelaire. And um, what I felt about them uh, was that they were, uh, as I called the piece eventually, the first and the last of the modernists. Uh, I would say that modern, uh, you know, it's, of course people don't understand how I put these two people together and could I possibly know anything about modernism if I could do this, right? You know? uh, but I, in the course of teaching modernism, I, I taught 25 years of course, it was called poetry and art, and. Uh, the first half was Baudelaire, the second half was Rimbaud. And um, I, uh, I basically uh, came to an understanding of what, of what modernism was about from my point of view, which was that, it, uh, that modernism was the first moment where art had to be made without God. It was, it was the moment when uh, romanticism and you know, going down and writing you know, a poem about daffodils beside the brook just wouldn't work. Uh, people had been, uh, as a result of industrialization, people had been transported by the millions into these uh, cities that could, no, could not contain them. They had to be totally torn up and reworked in order to, uh, to take the influx of people from the countryside. Uh, and that the idea of celebrating nature, of celebrating uh, man's place in a world uh, conceived of and constructed by God just didn't work. 
Uh, and so Baudelaire was in Paris at this moment when uh, Baron von Fiesman uh, was reorganizing the cityscape so that now the people were being moved out to the banlieue and the, the center was being kept for the rich people, but it hadn't really become uh, that yet. Everything was, there was no pavement, things were mud, it was, uh, it stank, it, sm it, it was noisy, it was, a, you know, the industrial world was the first world where there was actual noise as opposed to sound, you know? And, uh, and, and people were in t terrifying relationships with each other, exploitations of various kinds. And Baudelaire was in Paris at this critical moment and was perhaps the first person to understand that this was the new beauty. That, this, that God did not have to create beauty, that there was beauty and that man could create it. Man could become God and create this beauty. And not to, not to mention the fact that industrialization meant the need for empire. And what also happened is with the loss of God was the presence of the other. And this other could not be, could not uh, uh, become to grips with uh, th without excessive uh, intellectual effort, and not many people were willing to make that, but Baudelaire was willing to make that effort. One of the things that he did was, of course, he met and uh, formed a common law marriage with a young black woman from Haiti uh, and lived with her for 20 years. And he didn't just, uh, he didn't just watch her living her life, uh, he lived her life with her, so therefore, as a result of he was living with what the, uh, a woman who was, I would say, the first postmodernist. She was living the first, we say it, it's kind of like, you know, as a cliche that, uh, that uh, the, the immigrant, especially the immigrant female, is the ultimate postmodernist experience, right? This woman was having this experience in 1840. And, uh, and he was not just watching her uh, live her postmodernist life, from a modernist perspective, but he was actually being affected and having to live it with her in the sense that, for instance, he had uh, gotten his dream job. You know, he, he was a poor, he had lost his inheritance through stupidity and was trying to earn a living as a poet. Nobody has ever been able to do that. Uh, and so he got a dream job, which was to be the editor of a literary magazine in a town outside of Paris. He went down to uh, set up the apartment uh, before she came, and uh, when she arrived, the publishers of the, of the magazine said, oh, what's this? And he said, this is the woman I live with. And they said, oh, and that was the end of his job, and they both had to go back to Paris. So this was a kind of postmodernist experience that he was already having with her. And I felt that all of this uh, meant that he was able to embrace the, the rigors and the uh, horrors simultaneously of being a modernist artist. One had to become God to make art. And when I encountered, fully encountered the work of Michael Jackson, I felt that I was watching something similar. I do not know of anyone who had ever had a more exalted uh, I, idea of what the artist could and should be. Uh, nobody was more serious than Michael, nobody was better trained in his art than Michael uh, in, in that particular form of art. Uh, he took the history of his art form very seriously, he advanced it as well as he could, uh, but mostly what he felt was that he he, was, he, he admired his own talent, he recognized his own talent, and he lived, tried to live up to it the best way that he could. And one thing that he felt was something which was the sort of quintessential modernist dream. Michael actually believed that he could unite the entire world through his art. And that is it totally ridiculous concept, but it's a modernist concept, and the amazing thing is how close he came. There's not anyone else who's ever had a billion mourners. 
a billion people crying tears when he died. And so I put these two together in, um, I almost don't have to show anything else but this, because the, the most amazing thing is I had done this piece at, a, uh, at the invitation of a French feminist magazine. And this is what I was thinking about. And I said, well, I'm a feminist. What I send them is going to be a feminist piece. And I sent it to them, and the editor said, but Lorraine, why did you think this was going to be for a feminist magazine? And I said, because it has all the issues that feminism is concerned with or should be. And uh, that's, I would say, very typical of the way I functioned as a feminist artist. <laughs> what else is here? This is okay. So this is more pictures of, of, of the two. This is a uh, a quadruplex. Yeah. That's the end of that. You can sort of see what happened to them at the end and the kind of price that they paid mm -hmm. for their vision mm -hmm. of themselves, right? And okay, this is a piece that I did about myself called the fur palm. And it's about being. It's a uh, it's a palm palm tree trunk with a fur, fur foliage. It's Caribbean trunk with a New England fur foliage growing out of an African woman's navel. This is called The Clearing, or um, Cortez and La Malinche, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, and, and me. And I think, and I thought that because it, uh, Cortez and La Malinche were Latin America and uh, and uh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings with North America, and I was the Antilles that I had covered the Western Hemisphere. And this is just a piece I did in Central Park, almost in the same thing that you did the pink trash piece in. in our, uh, what our, was the year? Huh? What was the year? It was 1982. 1982, yeah. Right. yeah. And so this is also, again, about my uh, trying to pull together uh, my Caribbean heritage and my upbringing in New England. Kind of a crazy combination. This is, I would say, the most feminist piece I've ever done. So there you go. I'm going to just race through it. I've been told I'm having time issues, so here we go. You never know where help will come from. There was a, um, let's see if I have the picture. Is there a picture of me? No, they, don't, they did not include the woman in the white. This is uh, the father figure the New England, um, the, the, the Nantucket Memorial statue. That's not me. Is that me? Oh, yes, it is still me. But OK, that's not what I want to talk about. Uh, the, the Nantucket Memorial statue in this piece was my New England father figure. There was also a character called the woman in white who did nothing but great coconut. And she was my uh, West Indian mother figure. And in the end, when the, the main character has to be rescued uh, to be brought together with the, her other, her, the, her, the, her teenage self and her childhood self and sort of like form some sort of unified, actualized figure uh, to become an artist, um, the person who helped her was not the Caribbean mother, but the New England father. In other, in other cases, it's been the reverse. It's been the, it's been the mother figure who has helped her. But one never knows where the help is going to come from. One is part of these various things. And the same way that I don't understand how, uh, how feminism necessarily functions in the way I produce work, but it's there. And I think that that's the, that's the point, to be always alive to what is there and what is causing the work and solving, re resolving the work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. Uh, there's more there, but we're not gonna go there. Okay. So we've spent the day together and we've had amazing conversation We've talked about the varying definitions of feminism. We've talked about the incredible experiences of working as a collective. 
We've talked about class, gender, race, you name it. At the end of our afternoon, we all concluded that we also wanted to hear from you. I need one brave volunteer to come to the microphone. I'm not gonna tell you what I'm gonna have you do until you get there. Don't race, don't race. Don't knock each other down, but I need a volunteer. Thank you, one brave soul. And as she's coming to the microphone, I want her to think about what brought her here tonight and what she wants to learn from this extraordinary panel. I'm gonna speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, um, ooh, that's loud. I actually came up from DC um, specifically for this panel. Wow. I'm doing my master's thesis on this topic, so I really actually wanted to be here just to hear you all speak and get your perspective on everything. Um, and that's why I'm here. And just listening to what you all have said, and especially about the um, collective, the Where Are We At collective, it's really given me more ideas to work with with my thesis. So. So what's your thesis exactly? Um, it's on black feminist art and notions of representation. Representation. Okay. Oh, black feminist art and notions of representation. So. Great, great. Yeah. Thank you for being our, our brave <laughs> volunteer. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else, before we, before we turn this into a conversation, have a, a burning desire to tell us why you came tonight? One other person? Anyone else? Yes. Hi, I'm very happy to be in Brooklyn in your company and hear these, um, wow, ideas. I came because I really selfishly wanted to know what you think about money and if money is an obstacle to our presence in these spaces, when we claim that it's an obstacle to our presence in these spaces, or if it is something else. I was interested in the fruit stand. I'm interested, I heard uh, Linda went to um, Columbia Business School. Did I hear that right? That's right. Yeah, like, um, yeah. I'm doing a project about um, Wall Street and the 1980s. And I thought, if I don't come here tonight, Greg Tate is going to be real angry at me <laughs> if I ask him any questions, because he say I should have come here to understand black women. I have a mother in the 70s, and they came to New York, Wall Street, money, but did a lot of art. And I just would love to hear about gallery women and money. Great question. Thank you for both coming to the microphone. What's that? I, I thank them both for coming to the microphone. And I, I'd love to turn it to you four, one brave of you four, to talk about money. Um, d did you mean earning money from making art? I, I actually don't know. Oh. Money. So, would you like to know how, for example, I made my way in, as an artist? Is that what you wanted to know? Or how, how, I, how I survived as an artist? The idea of scholarships and scholarships having any relationship. You know, you know what I mean? A day can cost money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but let, let me just say, first of all, it's not selfish. Um, we, we all have gone through that. So you're, you're looking at a panel of women who have been around for decades. And what you just said is what we've all experienced, and I'm sure artists prior to us experienced it, prior to that and prior to that. Um, the whole relationship between um, fully actualizing oneself through self-expression um, uh, and communicating that to others and, 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 and how that work gets then commodified. 
and becomes part of markets that then we become dependent upon so we can survive. Like, I think that's just an issue that artists have been grappling with forever and ever and ever. So I don't know that there's one answer here. Um, I would say that one of the things that has disturbed me uh, since I actively, since I closed JAM in, in 1986, Sorry. Um, has been that when, Jam, when Just Above Midtown started, I was working with artists who had to make things. Like they were driven by their passion to create. And by the time we had gotten into the early 80s, mid 80s, things had changed. And it was interesting to watch that change because prior to that time, artists really dictated what was being made. By the early 80s into the mid 80s, with the larger art world, what happened was dealers and more importantly collectors and more importantly collectors from Wall Street who didn't know shit or shiola about art but wanted some art because they were told it would increase in value started to dictate and determine what got made. And these were individuals who weren't interested in understanding anything about art, aesthetics, or anything else. <laughs> they were just not interested in that. And so you saw from my perspective a kind of dumbing of, of patrons, uh, and you also saw a kind of acquiescence to that new market of buyers that undermined it, from my perspective, the passion that artists had. And so more and more, the conversation amongst artists, which used to be, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm using this kind of material and I'm doing this, those conversations started, taught, started to change to, what gallery are you in? Can you get into the gallery? Who's selling for this? Oh, did you hear so-and-so was selling for that? To the point where about six months ago, I was at a dinner party with artists. And artists who are doing well internationally. All male, nonetheless. Doing well internationally. And it was fascinating to me that after three hours, that all they talked about was the market. All they talked about was who was making what and what was making who. All they talked about, and at some point, I said, I need to get out of here, because it's just <laughs> corrosive. And I got up to leave and be polite and say, thank you so very much for tonight. And before I could fully stand, I said, what the fuck is wrong with you? I cannot believe that I have been in a house with all of this talent all of this creative energy and juice, and all you talk about is the market. It was the most amazing fight that ensued after that statement. So, is there an answer to your questions? I don't think so. I think we're, we're in process, and probably will be for the next hundred years in trying to figure it out if we figure it out then. My name is Pat, and I would like to ask you all a question. Do you think y'all were born with this talent or was it developed? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, personally, uh, both. And mostly, it, the art is from an unconscious place. It solves itself in dreams for me personally. Yeah, go on, Lorraine. Um, I don't know that I, 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 I mine is both. I think, um, I don't know whether the solution comes in dreams, the start often does, and the solution comes more intellectually. Um, is, I don't know if that's the answer to your question. I mean, I will get an idea for an image or a, a concept or something in a dream. Um, and then solve it because it then starts to present, it, it presents problems that have to be worked through, that have to be thought through. And I would say that the solution for me then becomes more intellectual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you get a little itch. That's what it is for me. Was I born with the itch? Does the itch come because I look at a situation and I go, hmm, I wonder how you could turn that around? 
upside down, lay it flat. And that itch just develops and de develops and develops until it becomes something. I'd say it's not for me so much on where it started. Was I born with it or did I develop it? it perhaps, uh, like Marin and, and Lorraine said, it's both. Um, for me, the big challenge is do I have the passion and commitment and determination to stay with it? Because that itch will fuck you up. It will haunt you for years. You will start to think you're crazy. Like, why are you trying to do this? And so for me, it's like, I'm glad you asked your question, because now I'm trying to ask the question, what makes those of us who stick with it stick with it? Because it's hell doing that. I can answer that question. <laughs> Good. I think those, who, those of us who stick with it, um, I always equate it to like a love affair. Like sometimes once in your life, you meet the love of your life and it's something that grows and develops over the years and it never goes away and it gets deeper, more intense, you become more committed to it. Because I think everybody is born with the in innate ability to be creative, but it takes those of us who are slightly jaded and maybe a little bit crazy to develop that and to actually think, particularly out of the era that we came from. We were all born with this desire and want and love of art, but uh, the commitment and the madness of that commitment to think that you could actually do something that nobody else had ever done, which was very simply to exist as an artist, just like artists have done over the centuries. Um, yeah. You, I think um, it's that commitment and the commitment, like in some relationships, you commit it for like a couple of years. Other, other relationships, you commit it for a time and memorial. That's pretty much what we're up here, you know, reflecting. We've all decided that this is what we want to do. We are in love with the idea of creating art. And even more so for us as women, and for myself in particular, I was in love, as I got older, um, with the, the idea of creating and be able to take this creation and make it mean something in the world. To be able to take this creation and inspire other people to get up and maybe try this, um, not even as a profession, but just to, just to release that part of you. You know, Dinga, I'm so glad that you mentioned the matter of love affair and commitment. It's really exceptional that this institution has committed to doing such a show that is going to reflect back on such an important moment 10 years into their history. So again, we've had a lot of time to talk today, and I would love it if you all would share a bit about what you hope the show will do or what it will be. Well, I think that um, I think that it's a very interesting idea that the uh, Sackler uh, Center is celebrating its uh, 10th anniversary with an examination, as I said, of its failures rather than its successes. Although uh, there's a way of uh, of uh, of, um, what's the word, you know, twisting that, or not twisting that, but like directing that so that it's a way of finding the most interesting discussion to carry the institution forward. Uh, remedy, remedying the past is the best way of welcoming the future. Uh, so uh, I, but, but those of us at the table who were all there because we had been omitted from uh, the uh, in initial phases. We were the ones that were we were the ones that were overlooked. Had rather different ideas than just simple recognition. We wanted um, we wanted the recognition to be meaningful, not just another example of uh, of curatorial power. Just making rather empty gestures to the other. 
We wanted it to be, uh, we wanted the show to be large enough, uh, important enough, so that it could make a difference into the, in the way the discussions were carried on in the future. Uh, in particular about black women artists and maybe even um, seeing us at the center of something instead of defined by the uh, feminist culture that we normally consider. So in other words, making us, giving us, giving our power value in and of itself, not in comparison to anything else, just ourselves. And I think we all felt that that would be a, a real innovation. Did you hear her question? She wanted to know at what age did you all start taking your, your art very seriously? Well, um, I pay my bills because I teach. I don't pay my bills from art. I teach art. And I'm very excited about teaching my students. I love the conversations we have about why you make things, the importance of being an artist and whatnot. But if I didn't have that job, I wouldn't be here. I might be making art, but I would not be here because it would, I would be destitute. Yeah. Um, but in part, I'm destitute because of the culture we live in. It's not entirely uh, my own doing or in my control at all. You know, it's part of it is being a woman and being black. And unfortunately, in our culture, that hasn't worked well in terms of financial remuneration, you know? But the thing about it is about all of us that we were talking about today, we all have um, these ideas about ourselves, which we're not shrinking violets. It's not about that at all. It's that because of the way our culture is, it's overlooked our contribution. Our contribution is absolutely legitimate and deeply felt. And you can see by the things that were shown tonight that people have been at it for a long time in a very, very serious way and in different ways. Each person has a different way of expressing what they think is most important about being creative. And all of, all of the ideas are wonderful. They're absolutely legitimate. But somehow, we haven't gotten the recognition so this show promises to help us and others like us and to rewrite the canon of the last 30 years. So this, this show promises to be a very, very, it has a lot of potential for being very, very helpful on a social, political, and aesthetic level. It's interesting because, of course, uh, the, uh, the show is still a feminist show. And so that means that it really is it's almost, almost outside the canon in itself. Right. So we're outside the canon, we're outside a canon that's already outside a canon. And I don't know, in some ways, one of the things that uh, mainstream feminism can do to uh, lift its own profile of importance and stature is to be a model of how to include a much larger framework. And I think that if the show can produce a frame of a model of, uh, of enlargement, then it can stand as something that can teach the rest of the money-driven art world on how to tr be gradually transformed. That, that's sort of the hope. Well, money isn't everything, right? 
Anything you two want to share about your hopes for this show? Um, yeah, I hope that this show will put us uh, where we belong, right, in the rest of art history. Because um, I don't know how it is today, but I know I had to read Jansen's History of Art, and they left out half, maybe three quarters, of the world. So at this <laughs> point, um, this will put us where we belong. Like I said, in history, it'll also empower other artists, whether they be man, woman, child, that you can do stuff um, sometimes outside of the mainstream and maybe at some point or maybe not, um, your contribution will be seen as just as valid as any of the other artists who've lived throughout time. Her question. Art is about, no, you're not supposed to. When you go to a gallery and see a piece of art, um, it affects you or it doesn't affect you. You decide as a consumer that I like this, I want to live with this, I want to buy this. That is the next phase. Um, and then you had that question about art, or when did you decide to become an artist? With me in particular, it was around age 10 maybe 11, and then the desire to be an artist preceded everything else in my life. That meant that as I grew into a young woman and then a woman, I had to figure out what I could do in my life to make sure that I would be able to create. With me in particular, uh, it was my ability to be versatile. Um, I started showing in galleries, and as my work wasn't selling, I was on the street on 125th Street making and selling dashikis. That brought in money. As time went on, um, I would get in situations where people would say, can you do a mural? Can you write a book? If it pays me, I can, and I would do it. And you just became, uh, or I became, because a lot of my friends went to school, they did things the traditional way. I went around that. Um, sometimes you don't succeed when you go around that. Sometimes you don't succeed when you do things uh, the way that you're supposed to, in quotes, do. However, uh, I think at the end of the day, it's what is your work like? Do you have any work? All of that's important. So. I think, um, I, actually, I know it's not a thought. I know that for me, um, I hope what happens with this show gives, gives us an opportunity to not comply with what has been given us. Like this institution, somebody else dreamt up this. And this whole notion of museums and galleries and blah, and blah, and blah. And we all just seem to, like we're all trying to get in it. We're all trying to be accepted by this thing that for me doesn't reflect how I might do it. Like if I had a completely empty canvas, I don't think I'd come up with this. And I'm hoping this show provides an opportunity to explore other ways of presenting work, of connecting work with the public than the ones we've got, because this isn't too terribly successful because of the number of people it excludes. It what? Excludes. 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 I'm very um, cognizant of the time, but I can't resist asking one last question, if you all will bear with me. I'd love to know more about the questions that you wished people would have asked at that time. Not all at once, but I'd love to know what you wished and hoped that people would have asked at the time that it was being made. You mean the work from the, the 70s? Yes, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. hmm. I don't know if it was about what people should have asked because I don't know if they knew really what to ask. <laughs> um, I think the only thing I can think of at that time is that uh, people could have asked 
why do you continue to do this? Obviously, you're doing it for uh, the broader good and that the fact that you as an artist are speaking from your own heart. Maybe the way that I speak might not be the way that she speaks or he speaks, but at least um, you can hear what I have to say. So and that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Even though uh, Just Above Midtown um, was a gallery, putting it on 57th Street in 1974 caused a lot of anger from the art world. And they were just furious. And which just, it's, on, on some levels, it surprised me. Um, even though we were a gallery, we did do things very differently than most galleries did them that were on 57th Street. And um, the question I wish they would have asked um, what would be to themselves. Why was the notion of something else some other possibility so disturbing that it pushed them to anger? Good question. Yeah, I find that the, that the uh, most uh, strange and unpleasant part of my success at the moment is that the work hasn't changed, the, world has, the world's ability to see it has changed. And uh, I don't think that, uh, had there been the lack of fear, as you say, the lack of feeling so, not challenged, but threatened, uh, had not been so extreme, that people would have been able to ask, well, why are you doing this? Or what did you mean? You never really did get uh, questions that asked you to clarify or explain. No. In fact, you, know, you didn't get questions at all. You just got attitude. And the attitude was almost universally dismissive. Oh, it was very dismissive. It was so, nasty at So times. that's, I would say, yeah. okay. I would wish. Great. So bring it home, Marin. Your wish. <laughs> Your wish. My wish. <laughs> well, it's the same wish that I had during our meeting earlier today, and it's the wish to be valued, and the wish for all of us to be valued for our intelligence, our gifts, our hopes, all of it. Great. Any last questions from the audience? Yes, before we say our farewells. You want to come to the mic? Thank you. So, I do this project called Is Your House in Order? And I'm thinking about legacy building and institution building. And I know there's this idea of being in the museum, but I'm wondering what do you do to write your own history? And what do you need from the next generation to help you do that? Mm, great question. Um, you know, I really think you have to have sympathetic people at the museum, in the museum, at the museum level. You have to have people sympathetic to your ideas somehow. Maybe a show like this changes, may change minds, or other shows. Maybe this show will encourage other shows like this. And maybe gradually minds will change. I think that's what we've all experienced here, which is not being supported. You know, your ideas just not being supported. So amongst yourselves, you support one another, but the greater world, the greater art world, which is seemingly filled with money for some people, is, is unavailable. So it's hard. And uh, that is a great question you ask. And how to gain support. That's the name of the game, just about. That's it. If you can get support from somebody, that's it. Do you have, it? Linda, do you have concrete something? I don't know how concrete it is, but it's, it's uh, what comes to mind right now, that question. 
which is, um, you know, legacy, it, it depends on how you define legacy. So let me define for myself. Legacy for me is not necessarily being in this institution or any other institution like it. Legacy for me is, let me put it this way, the project eats, project, <laughs> project eats, the project I'm doing now, um, we do on homeless shelters, we, we build urban farms on homeless shelters, we build them uh, in neighborhoods, Brownsville, Crown Heights, East New York. Um, we have a farm site right on Washington and Eastern Parkway, right on the grounds of this museum. Um, legacy for me is that moment, should it happen, and God knows I hope it happens, when the work that I do with people causes a flicker of hope to go into the eyes of a homeless man causes um, possibility to be expressed by the students that go to school across the street here, who we work with, causes a mother who is beyond exhausted at the end of every day and coming home to an apartment that has more ills than you can imagine, um, being able to say, I can change this, and I have changed it. That's the legacy I want. All oh, this shit don't mean nothing. So Dinga McCannon, Linda Good Bryant, Lorraine O'Grady, and Marin Hassinger, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.